Hello, welcome to the Coffee Conversation hosted by the Hugh Lane Gallery on the 1st of September 2021. My name is Aoife and I'd like to welcome you all to our discussion today where we'll be looking at the haunting and intriguing painting Night Thoughts by Belfast artist Daniel O'Neill. O'Neill was one of Northern Ireland's great romantic artists. Beginning his career during the Blitz in Belfast, he dealt with themes of life, love, death, birth and loss within his paintings. O'Neill's romantic imagery was popular with the post-war audience and his work has always been uh, enticing for its mysterious, enigmatic qualities that it has. In his lifetime, O'Neill exhibited in over 20 international exhibitions and including shows of Irish art sponsored by the Department of External Affairs, which toured the USA and Europe in the late 1940s and 50s, intending to showcase the very best of Irish art. In spite of great commercial success and acclaim, he was haunted his entire life by debilitating depression and a number of failed romantic relationships. All of the joy and pain in his life was echoed throughout his work, and Night Thoughts from 1948 is one of his masterpieces of mood. This work is representative of O'Neill as an artist surrounded by not only his own artwork, but by symbols of the very concepts that would enamor him for the rest of his career. Daniel O'Neill was born in a predominantly working class Catholic area in Belfast, raised in a Victorian terrace house on Dimsdale Street. His father, Francis O'Neill, was an electrician who married Mary Cash in 1917. And Daniel, was, their son, was born on the 21st of January, 1920. He was quickly nicknamed by his mother, Danny Boy. O'Neill had two sisters, Mary Bridget, who is believed to have died in childhood, and Bridget, known as Bridie who remained close to her brother for his entire life. The motif of sisters is one that reoccurs regularly in O'Neill's paintings, suggesting that the death of his older sister did leave an impact upon him. His mother Mary was the first to notice her son's talent for drawing, and O'Neill remarked once that his talent was possibly inherited from his mother, who had won a drawing prize at school. With his mother's support, he began to paint with watercolours from the age of 12, always preparing to draw from life and becoming a self-taught artist. He attended school at St. John's on Collinwood Street before leaving and becoming an apprentice electrician at Oren W. Knight Electrical Engineers and Contractors. He was working as an electrician in Belfast when the Second World War broke out in 1939. In spite of the impending war, O'Neill spent a lot of time at the Belfast Reference Library to learn more about art with the head librarian apparently bending the rules and allowing him to borrow illustrated books for the weekend, enabling him to study the, re the color reproductions of European art. He also spent a lot of time at the Belfast Museum of Art studying works in person. He did attend a few night classes at the Belfast College of Art, during 1939 to 1940, and it was there he met Sidney Smith, who both tutored him and allowed him to paint in his studio on Howard Street. At Smith's studio, the then 20-year-old O'Neill met Jared Dillon and Marky Robinson. 
these new friends introduced him to the world of inter of modern international art, artists like Cezanne, Van Gogh, Picasso, George Roy, and many, many more. Despite the war, Belfast was entering a period of great creativity. And during the war, the three young artists, O'Neill, Dillon, and Robinson, met frequently in places like Dewberry's pub to share ideas and discuss art. O'Neill and Robinson went on sketching week trips and weekends. And in May 1943, the tree exhibited in the Gaelic League Golden Jubilee exhibition of Ulster Arts and Crafts in St. Mary's Hall in Belfast. In 1940 to 1941, O'Neill began working as an electrician on the night shifts at the Belfast shipyard, at the bus garage, and at the Belfast Corporation Department, which allowed him time to paint during daylight hours at his family's home on Dimsdale Street. A friend of O'Neill's known as Quidnook said that for four years in his early career, O'Neill worked nights, slept for five hours and painted for the rest of the time. In 1940, he showed his work publicly for the first time, contributing to a three-man exhibition at William Mall and Sons in Belfast. In his early work, he worked very instinctively, kind of unsure of his final endpoint. And during the war, the young Belfast artists often had difficulty sourcing painting materials due to wartime shortages. Most of them trawled through the Smithfield market looking for wood cut-ups or went around the city uh, taking bits of rubble from bombed buildings. When the artists ran out of paint, they sculpted hunks of sandstone they found from bombed churches. Uh, at one point, O'Neill even pinned a tablecloth to a wall and painted on that. In 1943, however, O'Neill had his first and only joint exhibition with his good friend Jared Dillon at the Contemporary Pictures Gallery in Dublin. And the year after, O'Neill exhibited for the first time in the Irish Exhibition of Living Art. In 1945, O'Neill was taken up by the art dealer Victor Waddington, who represented him from 1945 to 1970. Waddington had opened the Ware Rooms in Dublin in 1926, coming to represent both Sean Keating and Jack B. Yeats in the coming decades, finally opening his own gallery on Dawson Street in 1944. Daniel O'Neill became one of Waddington's most successful Irish painters, and Waddington paid him a regular income allowing O'Neill to paint on a full-time basis from the age of 25. Waddington also supplied him with painting materials, as well as mounting all of his exhibitions, both in Ireland and abroad. O'Neill's first one-man show in October 1946 saw 21 of his 23 paintings selling uh, during the exhibition. When in two years of his this first solo show, O'Neill saw his work being shown in group shows in London, Boston, New York, Chicago, and other places around the world. <clears throat> Victor Waddington also made sure that images of O'Neill's work were reproduced in magazines, journals, and newspapers, ensuring he reached the widest possible audience. <clears throat> In the years following the Second World War, many painters left Belfast, with Jared Dillon and Sidney Smith going to London. This left O'Neill as one of the few artists who could afford to continue to live in Northern Ireland due to his success with Waddington. In 1947, the post-war traveling exhibition <clears throat> called Contemporary Irish Painting exhibited in America, where it was sponsored by the Associated American Artists. 
By the end of the 1940s, before O'Neill was even 30 years old, he was widely well-reviewed and praised by critics in newspapers, with <clears throat> the Irish press referring to him and his work as the accomplishment of a master. In 1942, O'Neill met his future wife, Eileen Lyle, the daughter of a mask weaver. In 2015, their daughter Patricia recalled to historian Karen Ryhill that dad and a friend were walking towards them and he stopped to stare at mum. He kept staring at her and told her she reminded him of a Gauguin painting. O'Neill and Eileen were married in February 1943 at the Belfast Registry Office. The fact that Eileen was a Protestant did not bother them as neither were particularly religious, but O'Neill still chose to keep it a secret from his, uh, from his mother. When Mary O'Neill did find out about the relationship, she went on a hunger strike until both Eileen and Daniel agreed to be married in a Catholic church. Both during and after the war, O'Neill modeled his female studies on his wife, Eileen. And one historian notes that the women depicted in his paintings seem to exist almost in their own kind of private world, as though they are seemingly liberated from religious control and social restraint. His work shows glimpses of the private worlds of women in their own personal spaces, such as their dressing rooms or their bedrooms. Uh, Rihel notes that O'Neill's late 1940s images offered the spectator an opportunity to engage in tender moments or engage in sensuality without being conflicted between the Catholic Church's prescriptions and or state censorship. Daniel O'Neill was a romantic artist, capturing human emotions and long pondered concepts in his work. Mercy Hunter in 1970 said that O'Neill was a romantic painter in the best sense of the world. The subject matter he drew from included love, life, death, birth, and everything he gave his own personal interpretation, his own personal statement, as it were. O'Neill's paintings convey a sense of vulnerability mixed with romance that evoked public emotions in the aftermath of the Second World War. For, for example, his work Halloween from 1948 was possibly a response to the atmosphere of suffering and uncertainty around him in the post-war years. To O'Neill, art was a living thing, and he became very aware and very conscious of the quality of paint and the painterly handling of his material. He enjoyed painting uh, in, in rural remote areas, particularly Rat Mullen in Donegal. He gained, gained inspiration from these country sides and landscapes. The curator and critic John Hewitt, in his essay on painting and sculpture in Ulster in 1951, mentioned O'Neill, calling him an out and out romantic, who in the last year has asserted his right to the position by virtue of his magnificent mother and child. The painting Hewitt refers to, now referred to as the firstborn, is in the collection of the Ulster Museum and wonderfully captures so much of <clears throat> O'Neill's style in the late 1940s, especially the distinctive figures with large darkened eyes uh, the, the, and the dramatic collaboration between intrigue and curiosity that draws the viewer into the work. <clears throat> All of these elements, these private worlds, these romantic symbols, the sense of intrigue are seen to great effect in his painting Night Tots from 1948. In Night Tots, 
we see a young man dressed in a vibrant red waistcoat holding a painter's palette in his right hand, lost in his thoughts in a gently lit room. The figure is very likely a self-portrait of the artist himself. Aside from the physical similarities between the figure and Daniel O'Neill, the red waistcoat and shirt it, he is wearing reoccurs many times in O'Neill's paintings and self-portraits from around this period. It's possible he saw this outfit as a sort of uniform for him, a recognizable uh, item of clothing that associated with him as a painter. In the foreground of Night Tots, we see a bowl of red and white flowers with green foliage, which again mimic the colors of the red waistcoat and white shirt. On the other side of the on the other side of the foreground, there is a candle, which is illuminating the room and everything we can see in it. Behind the candle sits a human skull, clearly visible on a table. While behind the figure, we can see a canvas featuring a painted figure that stands beside a window. The dimly lit reflection of the young artist can be seen in the mirror placed behind him. The use of the candle and the mirror were classic motifs drawn from Renaissance art, showing that the artist is not simply painting his studio as it actually surrounded him, but is instead filling his personal space with the emblems of art history. The presence of the skull is a reference to both artistic tradition of life drawing and human anatomy, but also acts as a memento mori, another popular motif in Renaissance and romantic art. A memento mori, a reminder of death, is a reminder of the transient nature of life. In this sense, it could be said that both the candle and the flower vase in the painting are also acts as are also act as symbols of the transience of life, as both the candle will burn out and the flowers will wilt. But this inevitable end helps us to appreciate the beauty of the current moment all the more. These same motifs, which occur again and again in his self-portraits, these are all symbols that he chooses to be identified with. You may notice that the three main objects, the skull, the candle, and the vase of flowers, are all situated on three separate tables. This is possibly a deliberate way of adding a sense of mobility to the painting as though these motifs are not fixed in place, but are instead free to be moved around as the artist pleases, just as though he were composing a still life. Night Tots could well be an autobiographical painting by O'Neill. The figure is quietly reflecting his expression deep in thought during this late night painting session. He stares contemplatively at the flower of vases, and the beauty that we see in the work is made all the more interesting by the fact that while we can see so clearly the surrounding area of the artist, we have no idea what the artist himself is thinking. In 1948, with the help of Victor Waddington, O'Neill traveled to Paris, a visit that was originally meant to La to be a sketching holiday of three weeks, but, but became a six month stay in Paris. This gave him an opportunity to study the original works of French painters he admired, such as Watteau and Roual. And when he returned to Ireland, his work reflected the Parisian nightlife that he'd experienced. However, while his career was flourishing, his family life was collapsing. His marriage to Eileen had been difficult for some years and following his extended unplanned absence in 
Paris evidence of his infidelities came to light, uh, ultimately leading to the end of his marriage. In addition to everything else, the random sectarian violence uh, attacked upon his family at their home in the Protestant town of Conlig became too much for Eileen to bear. And she returned to Belfast with their daughter, moving in with Daniel's mother, Mar Mary O'Neill. These life-changing events stood in contrast to the popularity and critical acclaim Daniel O'Neill was receiving as an artist. Between 1950 and 1951, O'Neill struggled to gain motivation to paint. He was haunted by the social stigma of broken marriage and the dis disappointment of both his sister and his mother, all of which likely exacerbated his feelings of guilt and forlornness. All these things led to a flare-up, uh, sorry, led to a personal crisis and a flare-up of an illness that would haunt him his entire life. O'Neill struggled with both alcoholism and severe bouts of depression. Historically, things like depression and alcoholism were not subjects that were discussed openly, certainly not during the 1940s and 1950s. And as a result, this would have made it even harder for him to receive the help he needed. In spite of these difficult personal issues, his work continued to be popular for much of the 1950s. A retrospective of O'Neill's work was organized in his native city of Belfast in 1952 by the Council for the Encouragement of Music and the Arts, or CEMA. Hung at the Belfast Museum and Art Gallery, the exhibition recorded more visitors than had ever attended one of the CEMA's one-man shows in Northern Ireland. In 1952, O'Neill met his next partner, a woman named Sheila Deacon. He spent most of 1952 commuting between his family home and Sheila's cottage in Saul in Downpatrick. But after a short while, Sheila sold her cottage and the two moved together into a two-bedroom beach house on the estate of Major John Corbet of Tyrella House. And as we can see in this work, O'Neill produced some very beautiful paintings of the surrounding countryside. When Victor Waddington moved to London, Daniel O'Neill and the sculptor Hilary Heron were the only living artists to move to London as well with him. O'Neill's relationship with C Sheila sadly came to an end by the end of the 1950s. But he met Nora Boyce, M Maureen Boyce, in the autumn of 1957. And so <clears throat> both Maureen and O'Neill both moved to London um, to a house in Holland Park to begin a life together. In fact, by the end of 1958, not only was O'Neill living in London, but his friends, Jared Dillon, George Campbell, James McIntyre, and a number of other Belfast creatives had all relocated to London, with one Belfast correspondent referring to the group of painters as an artist colony in London. In London, O'Neill was able to experiment with an entirely new medium that had just been released, acrylic paint. He found its plasticity and its quick drying time to be an exciting new material that motivated him to create new works. While O'Neill's relationship with Victor Wallington had been good for both of them for nearly 20 years, it began to fracture by 1963. Around this time, O'Neill spent long periods as a patient in Hallowick Hospital. Uh, historian Reichel believes he felt confined in London and with his deterioration of his relationship with Waddington, he suffered from very bad bouts of depression. This resulted in his colour palette 
move into a predominantly blue tone, creating a sense of gloom in his work, his way of expressing his emotions at the time. Very few friends ever talked about O'Neill's struggles with depression. Ryhill suggests that the references to O'Neill being mysterious and, or something of a mystery might be indirect ways of referring to his depression. Certainly, some of the dark and melancholic works reflect his thoughts at these periods during his life. Although O'Neill lived in London for 12 years, he always remained attached to Ireland. Wright suggests, uh, <clears throat> sorry, the painting The Promised Land, now in the Irish Museum of Modern Art, painted during his time in London, possibly speaks of his desire to return back to Ireland. He ended up separated from Maureen Boyce in 1967, right as a whole new type of tragedy was about to erupt at home. In 1969, the marches in both Belfast and Derry and the riots that followed resulted in a great deal of destruction in Northern Ireland. One of the places that was destroyed was Bombay Street in Belfast, near Daniel O'Neill's family home. On hearing what happened, he returned to Belfast because he was fearful of the safety of his sister and mother. It's at this time back in Belfast that O'Neill began to focus on the destruction of the community he had grown up in. Works like Terrace Houses on Fire were likely inspired by the damaged houses on Bombay Street. Similarly, Belfast after the riots shows a ruined building skeletal and bare, sitting on top of a pool of water, as though we are seeing it immediately after the fire engines have put out the fire. The building is still standing, but now it is stripped uh, and ruined, looking almost like a classical building from antiquity, a non-human reflection of the consequences of the violence that was happening in Northern Ireland. However, in spite of this great deal of unrest that the Troubles were causing in Belfast at this time, the galleries of the city were actually doing very well uh, in light of an improved economy, and they reached out to artists to represent them. It was in 1970, 18 years after O'Neill had last exhibited in Belfast, that he exhibited again with the McClellan Gallery on May Street. His exhibition in May 1970 surprised people who were familiar with his previous works. For now, his work was filled with bold and bright color, intense in a way it had never been before. His new work may have been shocking, but it did prove successful and the exhibition practically sold out. In 1971, perhaps uh, encouraged by these successful sales and critical acclaim he received by being back home, O'Neill joined Alcoholics Anonymous and settled down to a routine of painting and attending a local gym. There he met Mary Peters, who would win a gold medal in the 1970s Olympics and Buster McShane, an ex-wrestler who offered a taxi service to O'Neill in an effort to keep him on track in his new healthy lifestyle. Sadly, these things were not to last. In 1972, he suffered again from depression and spent periods of time in and out of hospital. An exhibition of his work was planned to be held in the Cleveland Galleries in 1972, but it had to be cancelled when the gallery was destroyed in the May Street bombings of December 1971. Also in 1971, both O'Neill's beloved mother Mary and his very close friend Jared Dillon both died. In the spring of 1972, his studio and flat were destroyed in a fire 
forcing him to move in with his sister Bridie. All these tragic events seem to harm his outlook on life and his attitude towards things. In 1973, he moved into his last flat at Eagle Tyne Avenue. The change in environment seemed to motivate him and he produced works in the late period of his life that were largely autobiographical. His painting, Divorce and Departure from 1973, shows O'Neill reflecting on the failure of his most important romantic relationships. We see in the foreground, Maureen seated at the left, while beside her, Sheila is in the center and Eileen is painted on the right in shades of blue. It's been suggested by historian Reichel that the figure on the far right in shadow actually represents the artist's daughter, Patricia, whose life was disrupted by her parents' separation with the little boat beside her, similarly representing how Eileen removed her and her daughter from O'Neill's life. In Horseman Passed By, a late self-portrait by O'Neill, we see a gray figure leading a man on a white horse away from a city while a, skele while a skeleton sits among the trees, suggesting that the horseman is journeying towards his death, a unknown but tragic premonition of what was to come. And only two months after his 54th birthday, O'Neill passed away on the 9th of March uh, in the back of a taxi in Belfast. Following his death in 1974, Daniel O'Neill was largely forgotten by the art world. His work was overshadowed by his close friend, Jared Dillon. Recently, however, there has been a resurgence of interest in Daniel O'Neill's life and work, especially as 2020 is a centenary of his birth. This renewed interest has allowed historians to really explore the man behind the beautiful, mysterious, and oh so intriguing paintings with brand new eyes. Mercy Hunter once said that I think Daniel O'Neill's great, great achievement is his linking of technical mastery to an immense range of expression, which is drawn from real psychological insight into life. I think that certainly rings true. He drew inspiration from the world around him, using his partners and friends as models and allowing his color palette to shift and change over the course of his career, using, using blues and greens to create desolate scenes of forlornness and bright, vibrant primary colors to imbue a sense of joy and exuberance into his work. With his painting Night Thoughts, the artist shows us his private world in his studio space but still his inner thoughts are hidden. The work is full of intrigue and mystery and we can see so many elements of what made him an artist, but we still cannot penetrate that dark gaze, which draws us ever further into the work, wondering and contemplating. I'd like to thank you all for joining us today for our discussion. If you'd like further details about upcoming programs, please see our website. And I hope to talk to you again soon. Bye.